Yo, what's good? As people trickle in, welcome, welcome, like, share, subscribe. You can share the stream right now. Uh, I'll put the link in the chat for the YouTube. That way you can interact live um, and then tell a friend to tell a friend. Um, panel's here tonight. How's everybody doing? Good. Good, good, good. good. Everybody looks wonderful. Adrian, you too. You know, <laughs> so shout out to that. So, uh, like I said, we have YouTube, which is growing fast. Uh, we have our page on Facebook. This might be risky. We also have a group discussion group called This Might Be Risky as well. Um, we also just signed up on Twitch. So we'll be streaming there also. And then we have Spotify and Anchor. So all those links should be in the description. Um, I'll also periodically try to put them in the chat if I remember. <laughs> So it is what it is. But yeah, we trying our goddamn best. So let's get right into it. So I was thinking, you know, we have we sign a lease agreement, it has an expiration date. Your license has an expiration date. Just about everything you sign up for, you have to re-sign up for. You can even refinance your mortgage um at certain times, but most time any if you have equity in it, right? You get another lender, so on and so forth. So I was thinking. A contract that also maybe has an expiration, right? Or some type of at will uh, clause. Um, the marriage certificate. Should the marriage certificate, right, have an expiration date? So in Maryland, our licenses, Sean, correct me if I'm wrong, last for 10 years. Correct. I think at home in Connecticut, seven, I think. Um, but, like, you know, you got to re register. So should marriage certificates have an expiration date, especially with the divorce rates where they are now? Aisha? I think it already does have an expiration date. To death do us part. Hmm. That's the expiration date on it. Okay. <laughs> now, with divorce rates being where they are, it doesn't seem factual anymore. I mean, that's, but you asked if it's, should we have an expiration date? I don't think you should go into something with something like marriage thinking that it's going to be doomed from the start. So I think to me, putting an expiration date on it, that means you expect for it to fail. So you don't agree with prenups either? I mean, to each his own. Well, hold on now. Let me hit the, because you said <laughs> it shouldn't have an expiration date, but a prenup is a just in case, right? Um, our women of today make sure they have a job and a career just in case. So they're not stuck just in case mm -hmm. the marriage goes south. So what's all that? How do you analyze all that? So I don't think that it should have, people should have a prenup because if, if you're taking care of somebody, if you love somebody, why don't you want them to continue to be taken care of? I think it's the same thing. Day. It's, Saying that it's going to end. It's doomed from the start. Okay, so it's not to each his own then. I guess. <laughs> Put him in the fucking bedroom. Get him out of here. It's Come not on. to okay. each his own, but I don't want to judge. But <clears throat> my, in my opinion, no, you shouldn't have a prenup. Okay. Uh, Kadiatu, what you Ooh. think? You called my whole full name. I appreciate you. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you know, so so listen, I, I, I used to believe in prenups. Um, you know, to me, prenups are a precautionary measure. Uh, it's a protection measure. Um, and it does speak volumes to how you view, you know, the, the marriage that you're enter entering into. Um, but I think it's just, it, it depends on the individuals involved. You know, some people feel like they have assets that they had or that they uh, curated before the marriage that they want to go ahead and protect. And I think that's okay. Um, but I also think that it's okay if someone feels like, you know, there shouldn't be a prenup because if you're saying that we need a prenup, that's saying that this may not survive or this relationship may not survive. Um, so I wouldn't get a prenup today. Uh, but I see, I see value in it. I, I definitely do see value in it. 
Um, and I don't think that marriages should have a, a renewal date. I think that's ridiculous. You choose every day to be in a relationship. You choose every day to be in a marriage. And um, and you do still have the option of getting out. Like if you choose a divorce, that, that's still a, a termination or an expiration date. So I don't think there's a need to say, okay, well, in five years, we're going to ev uh, evaluate this because you ain't acting right on year three. And I think by year five, I'm about to be out. I think that's that's a little... A little ridiculous a little bit but you but you but divorce is okay um i think there are solid justifiable reasons to get a divorce yeah sean should marriage certificates have a renewal slash expiration date no they shouldn't have a renewal slash expiration date um i think you people do renew their vows in good faith Right, they get to a point in their, when they're married with their, and then they get 10 years, five years, 15, 20, however many years it is, and they want to show that they're reinvested in their, their spouse. I think that's a good thing, but if you want to put, some, put something on paper saying you have to do that, renew your vows or re-register for your marriage, I think that could be, that could be dangerous because that mm -hmm. will give, people, give a lot of people an out that they probably wasn't expecting or didn't want anyway. But the divorce rates are so high, it's happening regardless. Mm -hmm. So why not put a clause in there, Adrian, to just say 10 years we can reevaluate without all these penalties and lawyer fees and having to get all these other things in place when we could just build it in since our society is leaning towards that anyway. And most people are championing it, what it sounds like. What you think, Adrian? Yeah, I'm, I'm all for it, y'all. <laughs> three three to five years though because like i said we already doing it anyway and then it's like it's not like it was right to where to like isha was saying death do we part and like the bible people don't base it on that people go into marriage thinking it's one thing then it's totally different and in the divorce the man is the one who suffers the most right oh don't do that that's no, he, the majority of the time hold on hold on hold on hold on let me go so <laughs> feelings wise even though we don't express our feelings we still have the loss of the family all of that emotional things that the women go through as well but nine times out of ten y'all keep the kids y'all keep the house we got to give y'all child support to take care of you we might have to give y'all alimony while still That's building and taking care is. of everything that we want. yeah right Y'all say that. Y'all ain't giving up y'all kids. Y'all say that. Y'all ain't giving up y'all well, kids. Typically, y'all don't want the kids. So don't even act <laughs> like it's something that y'all be fighting for like that. Nah, we do. We do. See, hold on. <laughs> nah, nah. So that may have been men of the past. <laughs> y'all got to give men more credit. Men be wanting their so children. What are these modern men doing in Adrian? How, did, how they taking care of the kids? What they doing? If they're not just making peanut butter and jelly sandwiches, it's tomorrow's part. Point. What do you mean? We reading? We reading? Mm -hmm. We picking them up from school? We doing hair now? We getting them? Um, look at it's so many. Like all, all my friends, all the guys I grew up with, we all take care of our kids. All the men I run it, there's way more men who are way more involved. And there's data somewhere I don't remember exactly what I read, but um, especially black fathers, we're way more active in our kids' lives than we used to be. And women will use that against us and try to keep the children away from us. And the thing, too, is depending on when the separation happens, like the woman automatically has a bond with the child because you carry the child. We don't really bond with the child until the child is born and then we're getting to spend time with them like that. So if you pull the child away from us too early, it's easier for us just to put a ball up and kind of keep it pushing. Right. But again, if the if marriages can with like a three to five year expiration have everything kind of built in already to where the man doesn't suffer as much i think women would do what they need to do to make the marriage work so but why put in a clause but why put in a clause that can dissolve a marriage instead of putting a clause that can strengthen one Thank you. I Because no, nobody is going to do that. Like, if we, we're dealing in reality, nobody does it. Everything I'm saying sounds good, but women, we know how women are the majority of the ones who leave, and we do know that, you know, it's for a variety of reasons, whether it's justified or not. No clause is going to make people say People are leaving marriages all the time, and, and nine times out of ten, 
the man suffers the most overall. But Adrian, so, to your point, wouldn't we suffer more if they, they got a chance to get away from us in a shorter period of time? So would, if it, we if suffer the, more, if the expiration is built in, Sean, it wouldn't have all those all that fallout, right? Right. It would just separate, right? So how like so? when you're, how well, so? so anything, right? So when you when you when your license expires, you either renew it or you don't. There's no penalty for not renewing it. I mean, but there's to no all the, penalty, but, to but all there's the things consequences. That, but to all well, the things that Adrian I, said, you know, and it's true, majority of times women do get the kids in a split, right? So if there's a contract that says we only go on for five years upon renewal and you got kids inside of that three or five year window, you're still losing the kids anyway. I think nah, that- you can have that all built in. All that built in. If, okay, so if that's if that's all built in, ain't no woman signing no kind of marriage certificate or license saying right. that they get they can get out of jail free car and the man don't have no responsibility. So I, I think for nah, some people, <laughs> nah. I think for some people this could be ideal. Maybe for some people um, of higher income, when I think of for, now for me that's not no option. I'm not renewing nothing till death do his part. That's what I signed up for. However, to me it only makes sense. If we decide, okay, at year five, we know we are tired. I'm getting sick. Of you, I'm tired of you. You're tired of me. At year five, we decide, you know, we don't want to do this anymore. If that is the opportunity for you to eliminate to eliminate cost that actually that you actually have to pay to go through the actual divorce, sure, why not? I know in the state of Maryland, you have to be legally separated for a year. In addition to that, you also have to prove two different residencies. You cannot the two cannot live together anymore. And if if they're found to do so, then it starts over. So that's more money that's prolonging the process. That's more lawyers and things like that. Now, if it were a situation where we had a renewal process and the purpose of that was to eliminate the lawyer fees, that's one thing. However, with the with the prenup, I think that's kind of, maybe that's something that people can put into their contract or whatever it is that they sign. But I think for most regular, regular folks, or maybe people who don't have kids, I think that maybe that may be beneficial, but I feel like it well, not think it gets a little muddy when you have children. Because mm -hmm. that would be my next question. How does that work when you have kids? All right, let me let me add some more to the to the hypothetical, right? So let's say when the renewal comes, right? The split is gonna be amicable. Okay. So it's gonna be as equal as it can be, right? So equal rights to the children in terms of visitation. If there were if there was a home, you know, I'm just putting it in here, right? That it would it would be sold and then split, right? So then that way everybody could win. Obviously, there's some fallout to selling a home, but in this hypothetical, the split would be amicable and am, amicable and makes sense for everyone. Okay. So as a, so, a single woman is going to sign up to get less rights because of a marriage certificate upon possible renewal. A single woman doesn't have to have a, an agreement in place to get child support or custody. So you're saying they're going to sign a document to get married saying that it has to be a 50-50 split? That's Are not you reality. Saying, I think it's a good point because what you're saying is marriage is a business. Mm -hmm. Regardless of however, you know, no, I, I'm getting married because I love the person. Yeah, ultimately that's the, that's the main reason. But marriage is also a business. You're getting married because you share benefits together. You get married because you get a tax break. Uh, a tax break. You get married because um, if this person is ill, I want to be able to make decisions for their life. So it's a business deal. The whole purpose of getting married is because you're gonna have the benefit of all of these things. So it's ultimately a business deal. So like with any business, you want to make sure. And I don't. So just really quick, I don't see any reason why there shouldn't, there can't be an expiration date. Not because you're going into it with the expectations of it being doomed. When I got my driver's license, I expect to drive until I can't drive anymore, right? Every year I just go and renew it. Things are going good. I'm still able to drive. I'm just going to go and renew it. The marriage would be the same thing. Things are going good. There's You wouldn't even think about it. The same thing with the car lease. You don't think about it. The lease is up. You're either going to purchase the car. You're going to renew the lease, get a new vehicle, whatever it may be. But you're just going to continue it. You would continue your marriage as long but as you're not, but you're not making you're a not commitment. Out. You're not making a commitment to another human being right. with a driver's license. 
Right. So the com <laughs> so the commitment piece is the same way. So, for example, I guess the example would be in your job. Right. You have a contract. You have an annual review. So I don't think that with this expiration date, I think there should also be a review process that should be happening. So uh, if let's say the expiration date is seven years, you should have a review process, maybe annually or whatever that happens. Don't wait till the seventh year to try to be like, nah, I'll be like, you know, the expiration date is today. Oh, I'm not going to redo. No, I'm not renewing it. Like you shouldn't be able to do that. If you didn't give me a verbal warning, I have my written warning. There was no talking to. You just can't not show up for the renewal. And what do we do with our annual annual review? If it's coming in December, we don't start now, working until October. Now, if you gave, so if we have these <laughs> annual reviews, right? And we came to the agreement, things are going good. You know what? Things have been going good. I feel like maybe we should, we could use some improvement in this area. Let's work on that. Let's put in a 90 day review, whatever that may look or whatever we view period that is Come it on, sounds man. crazy but that's i think that it would avoid a yeah, lot that's of that's bullshit i'm a lie i'm a lie like a motherfucker on a review yeah we honey, front but... for the review yeah come on listen yeah. you know if you're God. not happy but you Here's... also know you can't lie about your happiness you can oh you can't people... lie about your happiness but but i'm surprised that good I, I i'm surprised that you you guys are do y'all hear what sean is saying b i'm coming to you <laughs> but Sean, like, why would a woman sign up for this because it doesn't benefit them when it ends, like usual? Are women really thinking like that? Like, no, oh, just in case get I get up out of here, I can take advantage of this man. That's no, that's, like, that's, that's that's not that's not how we're thinking. I mean, no, the reality of it is, is when you enter into uh, into a relationship, both parties are supposed to benefit. So we're still right. coming into a situation where we're trying to see where we're going to get a value out of whatever it is we're entering into. And it's the same thing with the marriage. So a man isn't going to walk into a marriage without knowing that he's going to benefit from having a wife. He's going to benefit from having offspring. He's going to benefit from uh, being able to build with someone. And it's the same thing with a woman. We still have those expectations too. If you put in this like review process, or if you put in like a, um, a, a, a point every five years or every so often where, okay, we're going to assess our relationship. It's, it's not practical, especially when you're dealing with individuals that have different emotions and different things that are happening in the dynamics of a relationship. I just it, it just doesn't I, I just don't see how it it can work. So even if there wasn't an expiration date, well, hold, on, hold, on, hold, on, hold 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 on. Let me go. Let me let me get B in and then we can circle back. So B, should marriage licenses have a renewal slash expiration date? Um, well, for me personally, I don't think that it should have a um, <clears throat> expiration or a renewal date. Um, speaking for me personally, I know that if I'm in, so let's say if there is an expiration date on the marriage, let's say five years, 10 years, whatever number you want to throw out there. If year two, I'm not happy, I'm dipping. The hell with the expiration date, I'm just going to leave. However, that's me. I know me. I just don't deal with BS. That's just me. I'll pay the lawyer fees, divorce you, I'll be done. That's just me. Um, as far as a prenup is concerned, um, I can see to where a person would get a prenup um, in a marriage if they have um, lots of houses or a certain <clears throat> amount of wealth. Um, I could see that. Um, I, I could see where that could benefit the person if there is a divorce. I could see that. Okay. So I think everybody agrees that a prenup can be beneficial. Yeah, it can. In be. the event that the marriage dissolves, yeah, I feel like it's a preparation for when the marriage dissolves, right? But, we get, we get that shit does happen, but also you know certain things can null a prenup, also. Yeah, right? like certain lawyers and um, infidelity. I mean, you can put several different clauses in there, you know. So, I mean, I, I get it, but I just feel like you're just preparing for the worst, I guess. I and mean, I guess yeah, but it's. It's not preparing for when, it's preparing for if. And the reality of it is, is yeah. we don't know what the future holds. So, I mean, why not prepare for worst case scenarios? That's like saying it. don't get life insurance when you're when you're young because you're preparing to die. No, you right. have to you have to make those. I mean, things happen. So just in case, like I have life insurance on my kids. I don't okay. I don't want them to die while they're young, but I also don't want to do a fish fry if something happened to them. But like die that. is inevitable, right? Dying is inevitable. But not as a child, that, not as a child. Like you don't want to, you don't expect your children to die. 
You don't expect for your 10 year old to die. You don't expect for your eight year old to die. But God forbid, if something happens to them, do you have measures in place to be able to take care of whatever you need to take care of? So getting insurance on a child, some people That's feel not like- That's not the same. How is it not? I understand, I understand the analogy you're trying to make, but this is a covenant between two people where even people who are, I, I've been to, I DJ weddings where people are atheists or agnostic mm -hmm. and they still say until death do a part and somehow God makes his way in there and they always got somebody who's orchestrating the, the ceremony, right? So this is an agreement, I thought, but 50% of marriages in the U.S. end in, the, in divorce. 63% of second marriages end in divorce and 73% of third marriages end in divorce. So if 50% of us are getting divorced, why wouldn't we build this in? Because and, and also have, I was going to say, I was going to throw in a statistic. 76% of divorce rates are filed by women. Yeah. So I think, I think the, I think some of the points that were made today was that women are looking to burn the men, right? Mm -hmm. I don't think that's necessarily true. I think that if for whatever reason my spouse and I, for whatever reason, just can't make it work, I want to be fair. Well, that's that's but, your that's your thought process, but, right? But, but the thing but is, all is men, so, but, but all I men have an understanding. Go ahead. Go ahead. Right. Oh, go ahead. No, go ahead. You said all men have an understanding of what that women want to just burn them. No, that's 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 not what I was gonna say. No, I, <laughs> I said all men have an understanding going into a marriage that you can come out a loser. Right. So with that, men, all men so have an understanding. You want to have a prenup as a right. man, so then if that's the if if that is the case, and if you as a man are the breadwinner, and you know you guys have kids or whatever whatever the situation is that happens in your marriage, it would benefit you just in case. So that I'm you don't even... have to sit here and go through, oh, I'm going to lose my home. I'm going to lose this. I'm going to lose that. Right. It doesn't matter. It's written down. It's set in stone. Well, mm -hmm. a lot of, well, I'm not specifically speaking about men who have a, an absorbent amount of money or breadwinners. I'm just talking in general. If anything happens in the marriage, it's probably your fault. So <laughs> when it comes to court, when it comes to custody, child support, whatever it is, you, we have an understanding. We're coming into this agreement. That we may come up with the short end of the stick when it's over, if it's right. over. That's to, that's, that's an assumption already. Both parties involved. If you had an expiration date, right? Or you, with this expiration date, there's obviously going to be riders into it. If you have children, the expiration date might be a little longer. If for obviously, if you do certain things, you could get out of it before the expiration date. But it means that once this time comes up, if you guys don't agree and you're not on the same level, if you get married at 23, you're not the same person that you are at 32, right? So that person that you now are at 32, y'all may not agree with, you may not agree. You should be able to have an out without being uh, taken advantage of or, or, or having to pay extra for child support or losing your house or whatever. It's just, you should be able to walk away without having to lose everything that you that you have it's not fair in a, in a perfect a in a perfect world in well, a perfect world you're right the, yeah well that <laughs> but even even with even an with example a, so that it can be yeah, even with a, a expiring marriage certificate or a possible renewal you would have to have it it, it may be a lower divorce rate but it'd be less marriages because you will have people be more marriages why, no, no. I think, I think about people... how many think about how many baby mothers have been or girlfriends, 20 year girlfriends, 15 year old girlfriends. I've been with my baby father for 20 years and they never been married mm -hmm. because he's afraid of, to lose the money that he don't have. <laughs> well, that's probably for different reasons. <laughs> as you know what I mean? He's afraid to, because there's just there's this brainwashing that if you get married, you're gonna lose everything if things don't go right. Yeah, that's not these women would probably have more of a chance to be married if there was a stipulation where these men felt comfortable. Because men, I feel like, are brainwashed that if you get married and God forbid things don't go right or you make a mistake and she wants to leave, I'm gonna lose everything. Even if you don't have nothing, you still believe you're gonna lose everything. I'm just Is that why that. men aren't getting married? I'm so confused. I didn't know that. That's why men wasn't get, weren't getting married. <laughs> I don't know. I listen. If I'm not being no 20 year, 15 year, 10 year, nothing, I'm not gonna be nobody's 15 year old girlfriend at the wedding. You now, my 
uh, boyfriend that I had for the last 20 years dies and I can't make a decision on his, uh, you know, on his life policy. We have kids together. We've been together for 20 years and I get nothing. Um, right. Dre says that's how that's not how the system's set up. These institutions are set up to protect women. And then poop. I think he wanted me to put this up there for you. That's cap. <laughs> what what's cap? Uh, probably all the shit you saying. I don't know. <laughs> I live it in real life. Like this is real life. I mean, without any. I would just argue. I would argue that. My life. I would argue that there would be a small percentage of women who would sign willingly sign up to get a 50-50 split on all responsibilities if a marriage dissolves. So then because why are you getting not, married if you're not getting married because you love the person if it's only if I get majority of the the of the winnings of things that not, it's not, it's not about the majority. I don't believe it's about the having a majority of the winnings. I just I, I think women get married for the security too. Security and responsibility of having someone be able to take care of them. I I, I'm not just saying financially where it. a man is going to pay for everything. I just I just believe that women get married for security purposes as well. I imagine so that a, that like a divorce in general is just it's a lot of it's a lot of emotions and people do crazy things when they're mad and they're upset. I feel like whether you have a large lump sum of money or not, why not? I think it would be safe. I think it would be smart. It's a bit of insurance. While we are in our right frame of minds, while we are on a good page, let's put this in. So whether it's protection for the man or the woman, because you know, with the like people always say, I've heard people say like, it's cheaper to keep her because they don't want to go through all the foolishness of this. They don't want to go through the back and forth to the lawyers and negotiating this and negotiating that. You kind of, you eliminate a lot of that when you have that prenup. I would imagine, I would imagine. Because again, when people, they call them crimes of passion, when people are going through these emotional bouts and I'm getting a divorce, it's kids involved, there's property involved, there's money involved, there's you did this to me, you did that to me, why not eliminate that? Hmm. Yeah. Yeah, I just don't, I think that if a person's not willing to marry you, because you know they may not get more then you should be marrying somebody because you love them and you want to even if it ends if it, if this relationship ends tomorrow i still want the best for you yeah and if, if that person doesn't man. think like that then you shouldn't marry that person what world is this <laughs> and you don't know how you're gonna act and you ain't but... listen if a person that marries you or choosing to marry you like listen if things end tomorrow right not not after they done caught you cheating. Like you got to make them have this decision before. Oh. <laughs> Somebody else deep. said that's cap. <laughs> put, 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 put him in the fucking bed. Get him out. Yo, <laughs> right. Hold on. Where's my hat, Adrian? You about to say something? Hold on. See, been <clears throat> capping the whole time, man. <laughs> Adrian, gone to where you go. <laughs> <He's about> to <laughs> internet, like... Everybody who capping the internet telling on them, boy. <laughs> oh man. Listen. Oh. I think I think I don't know if I, what Sean's saying. I'm at first when he was saying, I'm like, damn, damn. but <laughs> no, he's upside down. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, hello. <laughs> that was a sign, Adrian. Oh, no, I, don't know. I got I got perfect service. I don't know what's going on. No, nah, <laughs> not 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 when you got US cellular, you don't. Well, I got Verizon. Don't do that. Don't do that. <laughs> Yo, why everybody who got good service always say they got Verizon? Always. Yeah. <laughs> Let me see the back Verizon, of your phone. Bro. Let me see the back of your phone. What you mean? <laughs> Freddy. <laughs> nah, but I think um, I don't even know who said it, but she was saying talking about like marrying somebody because you love them. That's the reason why people get divorced all the time because they're marrying for the wrong reasons. I don't think you should marry somebody primarily because you love them because throughout the marriage, your feelings are going to change, right? Mm -hmm. As I say, people change, so you're going to be changing from 23 to 32. They're going to be changing. So once the feelings change and you go through these seasons and the periods of when the love is not there then what keeps you together? So I don't think, I think the reason why divorce is so high, people don't know what it takes to build a marriage and it's not built on a solid foundation. 
that's why that three to five marriage certificate. You know what yeah. I'm saying? So what are, what are the right reasons though? What are, what are love, the right reasons? Love is the right reason. Right. Love love is the the right reason. reason. No. It's always the right reason. It shouldn't be the only reason, but it absolutely right. is. Right. It's That's the right primary reason. reason. Let, yeah. let, be the let primary, him respond. Let the him primary respond. Reason, the primary reason that you marry somebody should be because of purpose. It can't be feelings what? because feelings change. And when feelings change, the only thing that will hold you together should be purpose. Because that's solid. That's something to say, well, dang, even though I'm not feeling this person, even though I don't want to be with this person, we have purpose and our purpose is aligned. And if we split now, that purpose won't be able to fulfill itself. But well, feelings change all changing. the time. That's why people break up and that's why people get divorced. Purpose is ever changing. If anything, purpose. it's values that you should stand on because values are more static. <laughs> so, yeah, like it, it just doesn't about love should always be the foundation of any romantic relationship. And then value should be what drives the relationship forward and holds the relationship together. Like there's no way you can or that you should enter in it into a, a marriage and not have it based off of love. Well, I think we had this conversation before because in some countries people have arranged marriages and those right. marriages last a very long time. And the foundation is not love. Right. The foundation is can. love, can but, also, but also the relationship isn't sustained based off of likability either. Because mm -hmm. most of the times they don't even like each other, but they're building based off of whatever their value system is based, mm -hmm. is set off of. So I, I, I still don't even think that that's realistic either. I don't think arranged marriage mm -hmm. is, is right either. Yeah. So love makes you do all of those things, though. You Love is the driving what, force. What, what love is the love is the root the equation. Anymore, then you shouldn't be like, you saying, shouldn't be married to somebody you don't love. Yeah, I don't, you should I don't, not be married to somebody you don't love. Listen, I'm not saying you don't. Yes, you need love too, but I'm saying purpose has to be bigger than love. If you were to put a poll up, 99% of America would probably say yes, love is the most important thing in a marriage. But when you look at the rates as a whole, I'm not talking about individually. As a whole, the majority of them still end in divorce. So what does that mean? Stop making love the, the, the primary thing when it comes to being married. Like the data shows, everybody will say, oh, it has to be love. It has to be love. There's, there's no data on love, though. There's no data. The number no one reason love. that people get divorced is due to financial reasons. I think the point that he's making, because we've had this conversation before, yes, love is great, but love is not enough in a marriage. Right. Love is not going to pay your bills. Love is not going to help you do these kids. It's not going to help you do the day-to-day. -day. And there are going to be points if you've been in a relationship long respect. enough. Right. There's, there, like, if you've been in a relationship long enough, you know, you may not always like the person you with. You might not. You might go through these folks. I like, guess I love you as a person. I love what we built. But you know, in this moment, I don't like you. And people right. go through that. And I think to this point about purpose, aside from the love, what else is keeping you together? Are you staying together because this works for you in a financial situation? Are you staying with this person because you know what? They're a good help help for you with your health or your family. Is it? Is it there's multiple reasons. I think this point is, is that love is not enough. Yes, it's great to have. I think it's a glue that keeps things together. It gives you the little extra reason to keep pushing, but it's not enough. Because if that was the case, a lot of us would have married the first person that we loved. Well, and if you and, look and, back at the first person that you loved, and you may be like, you know what, if I had loved them and I married them, my life would have been this way. It may not have been as successful as it is right now. So I think that's the bigger conversation about it when it comes to, let me not speak for you, but I think that's what you're trying to say, Adrian. That is well, let me, ask, let, me, let me ask a question. Let me ask a question here. So for y'all saying love, tell me one relationship that y'all had that was based off a of purpose that failed. Well, to answer your to answer your question, I would have no purpose for any woman I didn't love. Right. No purpose. Yeah. None. Right. Yeah. Tell me a relationship that I found. I'm answering your question. Purpose. There, there, there is no woman I was in a relationship yeah. that was only purpose. <laughs> love is the driving force. If love doesn't enforce all the negative things, see, people have this idea that love is supposed to be beautiful and flowers. Yeah. No, no yeah. love is waking up when you don't want to see nobody and still yeah. dealing with them. Mm -hmm. Love is the is the driving factor. Love is what makes you do all the dumb shit that comes with the relationship. 
And love is a love. choice every day. Like you wake yeah. up choosing love, choosing to actively love, you know, your your significant other. So it's not mm -hmm. easy. I don't think anyone ever said that love is easy. Um, no, right. but people assume people assume that not that it's easy, but it's supposed to be lollipops and gumdrops. Mm -hmm. That's not the real world. Yeah. Right. So well, I think world. in addition to love, right? Because love is very important, but there's also the respect factor. Mm -hmm. So you could love somebody, but maybe for whatever reason, you might have something that's going on <laughs> mentally where it's just completely disrespectful out of the, your control. You still love the person, but things just got too wild. Doesn't mean that the love is lost, right? You could love somebody, but you know what? I'm struggling with addiction or I love this person, but I'm also struggling with mental health to where it leaves the person neglected or whatever else is going on. It doesn't mean that the love is absent, but that's also not enough to keep the relationship going. I agree. But when all those other structures break down and now your purpose changes with this woman or your purpose changes with your partner, or whoever, what do you what's, what are you based on? What's your foundation? Because if it's, if it's not based in love, then you won't have enough of anything else to sustain any relationship with anybody. Right. And to your so you point, would Alex, love somebody to the end of time. To, to, to your you point, Alex, where you were saying you you could have loved married somebody you loved, you know, back when you, in your youth or whatever. That's true. But were y'all centered in love together? You could uh, a lot a lot of a lot of times women have loved men more so than women than men have loved women, especially in the youth, right? We don't really see it the same way y'all do. Y'all could fall in love at 18, 19 and it'd be a magical thing for the rest of your life. But that's not really reality for us. So when you meet someone and you're centered in love, every all the bullshit you go through is founded, founded in love. Everything. If right. you have yeah, beef, yeah. if you don't want to wake up next to them, if they get on your nerves, if they bad with bills, if they hanging outside too long, if they not coming home when they're supposed to, Everything falls back to love. Do you love that person enough to drive the purpose? To right. drive the day to day. What if that, part, what if that person good. never changes so that you're just supposed to just love them through all the and just. No, the, I'm not saying you're supposed to do anything. I'm just saying that the driving factor of a marriage or relationship is love. That's it. That's all I'm saying. So, okay. so I think the question, a question was posed earlier, though, and Alex, you can jump in. But all these marriages are failing because of the foundation of what you're describing so if even if they are is it the right thing and then one thing i was thinking about alice before you jump in is you can get a lot of what you get from love from fear mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and and that's 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 probably something we need to think about if somebody fears you you can often get them the same thing we do if they love you and the difference with people loving you is they also willing to take more advantage of you because they don't fear you. And a lot of people get hurt by the people which they love. Um, Alex, what were you about to say? No, I was just going to say, like, I agree. Like, love is super important. Love is what makes me want to give it another try another day. However, what we have said in previous conversation is that love is not enough. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I've heard people say, like, you know, I love you, but this just didn't work out. And just because you love someone doesn't necessarily mean it's the most fruitful situation for an individual to be in. So back to my point again, love is not enough. You need more than love for the relationship to be successful. Love is just intertwining. Love is intertwining all of it. It's the glue. Hmm. Okay. So <laughs> we kind of went around about, but um, final thought be on the whole conversation Ooh, well it was a lot um mm -hmm. my final thought um mm, sign a prenup that's my final thought yeah. <laughs> exactly. you got two dollars in your pocket sign that you got two dollars in your pocket put, put, put him in the fucking bedroom get him out of here uh well we don't get into that <laughs> no doubt no doubt no doubt hey awesome conversation and things can go left right up down so quick you know with those type of questions um interesting i'm gonna I'm ponder on it because i still feel that love is slightly overrated but um we'll see so if you just you know tuning in you know welcome welcome this might be risky see my panel up here looking uh amazing as usual and we're gonna jump into the next topic so is mental health 
uh, why is mental health so taboo in the black community? Is therapy needed? Is it important? Will it help to progress us forward as a people? So why is uh, mental health so taboo in our black community? Alexis, we'll start with you. Um, I think in black communities and black families, a lot of time we have a, we operate off of a don't ask, don't tell. Um, it's not appropriate to talk about things that you're feeling outside of the house. I know for black men, showing your emotions and showcasing it, you're looked at weak. For black men, for black women, I think a lot of the times when we don't show our emotions and we don't talk about certain things, people think it's a term of endearment to say, oh, you're so strong. You're so strong. And I think we've allowed that. And saying that we are so strong, I think a lot of times for us, it's allowed us to suppress a lot of feelings and not really express what we need. I think we are now in a beautiful place now where we realize and we're understanding that, you know, we have to heal our traumas to move forward. There's nothing wrong. We all have mental health. And I think now is a point like we take care of our body. We go to the doctors for our physical bodies. But I do think now it's time to take care of our, our mental health. So that we can move forward. Suicide rates are up. And it's not just the white people thing. It's also happening in our community as well. Um, I, I really don't have a direct answer on why it's taboo, but it is. But we're slowly breaking out of it. And I, it's a good thing. Can't hear you, Ham. I know recently uh, Regina King, her, her son, just committed suicide. And I was listening to, you know, people always give their, this person was so loving and caring. You know, there were some of his attributes talking about how much he cared about other people. And they often give that description. Um, they said they didn't release it while Demarius Thomas, he was a football player um, that played for the Broncos. They didn't say how he died. They just said they found him dead, but similar attributes, you know. So why is mental health so taboo in the black community? Um, and if we break out of that, you know, will it progress us forward? Um, Adrian, what you think? Adrian can't get it again, right? <laughs> <laughs> the is not doing him justice. <laughs> Go ahead, Sean. What you think? Unmute yourself, Sean. Okay. It, it is taboo, and it's taboo because of what we've always been taught. Um, if you've had a problem in the past, oh, you got a problem, pray about it, go to church, go to the altar, right? <laughs> you know, we're not going to talk about it, but you can go to the altar and give it to God, and he's going to help you fix it, right? Uh, so that's always been a problem. And in, inside of families, not just the large community, but inside of families, we've always had somebody in the family, oh, don't, you know, Uncle Charlie, something wrong with him, leave him alone, don't, don't mess with him. You know what I mean? It, it, that's always been a thing. Um, do I think therapy is important? I do think therapy is important. Uh, I think we don't. We're, I think a lot of our older generations are kind of scared to have the conversations of what went wrong with them, so that's trickled down into not talking about it much. To what someone said, uh, "Don't ask, don't tell." You know, that's a policy that military uses, but that's a, in the black community and it's prevalent. I, I don't think that you know our older generations. Have had they, they didn't have time to sit down and go through their problems. They didn't have time to deal with them. They had kids, they had houses, they had families. Men worked 14 hour shifts to come home. They couldn't talk about their problems or how, how depressed they were or having a bad day. They had to get up and repeat the same schedule. So I think we have more time now. We have more freedom. Our careers are a little bit different. You know, we have a luxury. We're not doing a lot of hard labor anymore as we used to. So we do have the time and I do think it'll move us forward. It progresses. Okay. Slim, what you think? Um, I think it is taboo for, for several reasons. Um, I had did a post just like two weeks ago about, um, you know, just in my youth, by the time I was maybe in 11th grade, I already had three friends that had committed suicide, mm -hmm. right? Um already by 10th grade, I've already had two experiences where I saved outside of three friends that were successful in their suicide. I've saved two people from suicide attempts. So I think that the connection between all of those people is kind of echoes what everybody else is saying is that there's this 
uh, thing where what goes on in our house stays in our house, um, specifically black communities or whatever. Like you just don't want to. So a lot of times people don't have outlets, right? You have to keep a facade. You don't have an outlet. Um, you're considered weak. Most of the two out of, of the three people that, that were success, successful in their suicide attempts were men. Um, Regina King's son was men. I know, I think a lot of men in particular just don't have outlets to be able to release their stress. Um, is there an opportunity for improvement? Yeah. Um, I don't know. I don't know how we can, how we can change it. I mean, we, I, I think that now, um, Everybody in the internet messing up today. <laughs> Man, I can't. That's crazy. So, so I think you guys are right. So, you know, I know a lot of the topics like you know suicide rates. Men do lead in suicide rates. Um, I don't know how I feel about suicide though. What you mean? Like, in terms of like, like the. The empathy I have, right, when it gets so hard that, you know, I do something which I deem can be, I have, you know, people have kids, they still do it. Um, people have lives, job, people depend on them, people that love them, right? And I feel like it can be also seen as, like, almost selfish, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. you know? And so I don't want to, you know, speak poorly, like, on the dead or, you know, the fallen, but when you take your life... And there's so many people around you that depend on you, that love you. Like, you know, I just feel like, but again, I guess that's the point where we just fight through everything all the time. Mm -hmm. But do we just, is there a point where you just stop fighting? I like think this, when someone gets to the point where suicide is an option, they don't feel like there's anyone that they can talk to or that they feel like if there's anyone that cares enough about them that if they do die, that it will affect them. So to them, it's definitely not selfish. Yeah, we but, feel like but, you know, I be doing it, doing them a favor by just offing myself. Yeah, but that that's not always necessarily, uh, you know, the case. When you when you think of, um, you know, the the psychology behind the human mind, um, mm -hmm. there's just so many complexities there, mm -hmm. you know. So it's never just a, a one size fits all. Meaning, people don't always those that do commit suicide. It's not always because. Uh, they're just tired of life or they feel like no one is there to love them or, or to care care for them or care about them. Sometimes it's that 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 extra mental stimulation of negativity that's constant. They wake up in that negativity and they go to sleep in that negativity and it's and it's claustrophobic and they don't know how to deal with it. Mm -hmm. And the selfless thing that they feel like they can do is to take their own lives so that way they they are they aren't a burden. On their family and friends so sometimes it's, it's also that perspective too so I, I don't necessarily think it's selfish um i think it's selfish for those of us who 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 live and and have dealt or have to deal with people who have committed suicide to say oh that person was selfish um because we don't know what uh led to that person taking their lives or what was the last straw Sometimes it's that one mental break where it's just like, I can't wake up another day feeling like this. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I just rather not be here. Sometimes not being here feels better <laughs> than being here. You know, this life is not easy. Now, I think you're right where the intent wouldn't be selfish, but aren't things still, still what they are regardless of intent? You just might call it something different. Like when people kill people by accident, you're still killing them, but they call it manslaughter. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right. So if it still if it still has the same fallout, regardless of intent, isn't it still that thing? It's a matter of perspective. Yeah, I think with mental health, a lot of times, too, um, it's about the lack of diagnosis. Right. So we even know with kids that have ADHD, like, no, he just need to sit his ass down. If I slap him, you know, you need to listen. No, it's a real diagnosis. It's a real mental. It's a real issue. And so it's whether or not. Uh, people want to accept these diagnoses and get the the right help that they need to treat it. Right. Right. Now, um, and 
instead of saying, you know, to Sean's point, we all had one uncle that either sat in the room in the back room and drank soda and smoked cigarettes and we just didn't bother him. But we never really talked about what was his real diagnosis? What's going on with him? Yeah, right. So it's the it's the it's you have to overcome the fear of being diagnosed or labeled with whatever it may be that you're suffering with. Mm -hmm. If you're bipolar, if you are dealing with depression, that's OK. But I think the fear of being labeled prohibits people from getting the help. Mm -hmm. And if you're not being helped, it's easy for you to fall into to suicide or whatever, you know, it's easy to fall into that. So I think overcoming the fear of being labeled and getting the treatment that you need for whatever that looks like, if you're bipolar, then cool. I mean, there's pretty right. pe plenty of successful people that have bipolar disorder or whatever other disorders that are out there. But if they go untreated, it could it could end badly. And we, we have to do a better job of destigmatizing being bipolar or Absolutely. or thinking bipolar is cool, right? Because we we didn't grow up like that. We weren't we did we don't have that learned behavior to say Uncle Charlie in the corner is bipolar, you just let him chill, right? But if or we called him bipolar, we, we would say he's crazy, right? Because that's how we grew up. Yeah. So we have to do better at destigmatizing those words, those labels, those determinations, even on children or, or you know, older adults or whoever it is. We have to do better at that. Uh, a lot mm -hmm. a lot of times, like you to your point, Slim, that label, you know, it points a negative light on you. So you don't want to try to go get help mm -hmm. if you feel like something's wrong. You okay, feel hold like on, Georgie. Wrong. Be yeah, what you so think. Um, there's two points I want to um hit on. Um, okay. what Slim was saying in terms of the diagnosis, if I'm pronouncing that word correctly, probably not. But anyway, um, I have noticed in the black community, we will tend to sit back and say, "Oh, how do you know you have that?" Or, um, the doctor said you have it, but how do you know you have it? Because um, Slim actually used an example, ADHD. I have ADHD, and my mm -hmm. friends found out that I had it. They said, "Well, how do you know you have it?" I said, "Well, the doctor said I have it." They said. Oh, well, how does the doctor know you have it? So in other words, you're telling me is this doctor went to school for years and he sat back and diagnosed me with ADHD for you to sit back and say he don't know what he's talking about. Mm -hmm. Okay, cool, whatever. Well, that's what you think, then that's just what you think. I ain't going to argue with you about it. Nonetheless, it is what it is. Um, another point I wanted to hit on is I noticed that therapy can be very helpful in the black community if a person seeks it. Um, I go to therapy because I have issues stemming from way back when I was born. You know, I have issues and I will tell a person I'm not normal. So I need therapy in my life. And I've noticed that it's helped me in lots of ways. Why all of my relationships haven't worked out. Why I struggle with the women issues that I struggle with, um, with the birth and the death of my mother. I have struggled with all of that um black and white you know i see things in a gray area i don't see them in a gray area not as much anymore but sitting down with that clinician and putting everything in the perspective is help and i noticed that maybe until the day i die i'm gonna need therapy because if i don't have therapy something something and someone <laughs> it just ain't going to, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So i need that and i've noticed it has helped me in lots of areas um, and I've noticed as well, lots of black people who go to therapy, they have they have a better life. Um, and there's nothing wrong with that. You know, I have issues and I'm not afraid to tell anyone that um, I have a short fuse, you know, and I'm not afraid to tell anyone that. And therapy for me helps keep things in line. And another thing, too, I've noticed a lot of in the black community, people don't want to get therapy because of, you know, the cost of therapy. Um, but there are free services that you can go to i will admit you have to look into those services a little hard but if you get a case manager whatever whatever they can help you with that but there are free services available out there um and i can say i do live a somewhat better life um because of therapy Qu question b and then Isha, you could jump right in i just want to ask them a question so 12.8 percent of black children are more likely to be diagnosed with adhd so when people are asking you that, are they being facetious or, you know, when they were asking you, oh, yeah. maybe they're being facetious. But shouldn't we be asking those questions if, if our kids are in school systems 
and they're a little bit more rambunctious because we're more athletic. We got more testosterone. We got more melanin. We got more gifts from God. Right. Oh, uh, yeah, absolutely. Um, absolutely. The key component to it is, though, ADHD, a lot of people get caught up on the hyperactivity part. Right. That yeah. is just one component of it. Mm-hmm. Um, there's more to it than just hyperactivity. Um, what I would say, though, is any child is hyper. So you just can't sit back and say, oh, well, because he's hyper, he's jumping off the wall. He has mm-hmm. ADHD. I mean, I had a nephew who used to jump off the bed onto the floor, but he doesn't have ADHD. I mean, it's just what kids do. They're hyper. So there are other components to it, which is why going to that clinician and getting sat down and taking tests will help determine if by any chance you do have ADHD. Um, so, yes, absolutely. Ask those questions. Ask those questions. And mm-hmm. ask the doctor. You know, question the doctor. There's nothing wrong with that. Just my thing is when a doctor says you have it and then you sit back saying I ain't got it, he has no fight in it. So him telling you he, mm-hmm. that he had that you have it, you're telling the doctor you don't have it. This man went to school for 10, 20 years. You want somebody to tell the doctor, man, this motherfucker now. Isha, what you was going to say? <laughs> um, sometimes trauma responses yes. present themselves as ADHD. And I think that's why a lot of kids in the Black community get diagnosed with ADHD because they've been exposed to a lot. And a lot of times we don't think of it as being trauma because we're just so used to it happening. Well, mm-hmm mom got raped so her daughter got raped so that's normal to us and that family and we can't talk about it but it's still trauma and a lot of times people in the black community don't seek out help because the people providing help don't look like us right so we can't we're looking at it like how are they going to understand me and what i'm talking about or how am i going to tell this lady on my business and not feel judged And Mm -hmm. as a social worker, I do child protective services. I have plenty of cases that come in because a mom went in to tell her therapist what was going on with her mental health. And now now she has a CPS case. So I think the system, the system and the black community in impoverished communities Mm -hmm. is just not working the way it's supposed to be working for us. And that's why we don't seek out mental health, mental health help. Would you say there's a lot of a lot of bias that you see? So when people do seek out help, there's a lot of bias that's happening from the mental health that's, professional or definitely right. Also, too, I think people don't know the reason to go to get mental health services. Um, I think people think that they have to be feeling sad or something like that. Like depression and anxiety shows up in different ways. You know, sometimes people's body physically reacts. Um, the inability to sleep sometimes, you know, just overactive thoughts, like a lot of these things. And like, it's not normal. Um, a lot of times I hear people talk about like, you know, this generation of kids, you know, they're desensitized and where some people live, you know, um, you've got kids who are in areas where, you know, they're losing people left and right. And to the outside looking in, they're just like, oh, that's just what they're used to. No, they become desensitized to it. And it's not that they don't care but it's like it's traumatic mm-hmm. and their body is reacting a certain way like those are things like they need to learn like that's not normal you having issues sleeping and and your mind over racing and you having a short fuse like let's it's coming from somewhere and i think a lot of times people just think oh well if someone isn't acting out or they're not acting strange they don't have mental health issues and that's not the case so i think for us in the black community it has to be mental health period has to be normalized and then i do agree to your point isha like having someone that looks like you is a game changer in anything in the education system in the healthcare system period having someone mm-hmm. that looks like you who culturally understands what you're talking about is a game changer yeah representation really like like really matters like it took me a minute to find a therapist that Mm i um that i i felt comfortable with you know because there are so many more um white therapists than there are you know uh, therapists of color um and there's a cultural aspect of it so even though every therapist may have the foundational understanding of how to uh treat mental um illness there is a cultural piece that that they only understand fully if having experienced some of the same things as their as their uh, patients. Mm-hmm. 
-hmm. you know, so I do think that it's it's a it's stigmatized in our community. But the reality of it is, is mental health um, or mental challenges are not specific to race. It's not specific to gender and it's not specific to culture. Like we, we are all human beings. We are all going through this human experience and this human human experience is traumatic in itself. So it always helps to get an objective view to help you process emotions process feelings, um, you know, just process, you know, whatever challenges or traumas that you're dealing with. And I think we also need to do a better job at um, checking in on our friends and um, allowing our friends or creating a safe space for our friends to be open and honest. So when we're hitting up, up, hitting up our friends and saying, hey, how you doing? You know, are you good? And if they say, oh, I'm not good, not brushing it off and being like, oh, you, you, you playing or, you know, whatever. I kind of dig in deep and say, well, you know, what's going on? You know, what's good? Is there anything that I could help you with? I don't think we really do a good job um, as a community just lending a hand and saying, hey, I'm here to support you. I'm here to help you. You know, if you if you need anything, we a lot of times, especially the men, tell them to suck it up. You know, oh, you're going to be good tomorrow or, you know, don't worry about it. You know, and that's not OK, because the reality of it is, is we don't know if they're going to be good tomorrow. And we don't know if whatever it is that they're going through can be sucked up. Maybe this was their last straw and us saying, oh, well, suck it up, uh, you know, leads them to believe, well, I can't share how I'm feeling with this person or anyone else. I'm just going to go ahead and hold it in. And and that it, it builds up. And then we end up in situations where people shut down or where people feel like they have no other outlet other than to turn to suicide or to turn to cutting themselves or to harming other people. Um, so yeah, culturally, I think we, we really damn ourselves in a sense by expecting black women to be strong all the time mm -hmm. and expecting black men to never, you know, express or show their emotions. That that's, that's definitely our flaw culturally. I feel. Caddy, I got a question because mm -hmm. something, I just want to get clarification before I qualify it. So you said um, we're all going through the same thing because it's a human experience. Oh, not going through the same thing. We're all going through the the. We're all going through a human experience. So but all you, of our experiences are in, independent of each other, but we're still going through a human experience, regardless of race. Regardless, no, the human experience would probably be a little heightened than. Well, well, my question is. If it's like regardless of race, why do we need to identify with the therapist? Oh, because there's a cultural aspect. So what? I, so you don't conflate what I what I said. Like what I'm saying is, is we all have traumas, regardless of race, gender, um, or any uh, demographic. Uh, mm -hmm. But there is a difference when uh, addressing that trauma, and in addressing that trauma, it always helps to have representation and the clinician that we choose to help guide us through those traumas. So to have a therapist that looks like me, um, that maybe is a part of the LGBTQ plus community, you know, so that way I can share experiences and that person, that therapist will understand exactly where I'm coming from. That makes a difference. If I go to a white woman, a straight white woman, uh, and I talk to her about some black shit, you know, <laughs> she may only be able to understand to a certain extent because she doesn't have any yeah, of her own right. experiences to associate with. So, so with that, are you, so Adrian, let me ask you. So you're saying that the only way we can achieve success in therapy is with sympathy, right? They have to know the experience. So therapists go to school all this time. And we're, are we saying empathy is not enough? No, I'm is enough it's not oh. sympathy yeah so you have to you definitely have to be empathetic and you have to have a high level of eq to understand someone past your experience and mm -hmm. so therapists are typically taught that but there's still a, a, a learning curve a cultural learning curve that they miss if yeah. they don't have that um if Simple. they don't have that intrinsically, meaning if they don't come from the same type of background or a similar background. So meaning I could probably uh, get help from a black male therapist, um, but he still will be missing the, the gender aspect for me. Um, but he'll still be able to understand the black experience to a certain extent where we can, you know, kind of relate. You, you see okay. what I'm saying? Like the, I, I understand, but I just want to find a therapist that truly is without bias. But it right? sounds like... Yeah, mm -hmm. that's that's what I was about to say, Alex. Yeah. It sounds like more comfort, right? Because 
empathy, based on what you're saying, Caddy, just mm-hmm. being transparent, doesn't sound like it's enough, right? Because right. empathy means you did not have the experience, mm-hmm. but you make me feel mm-hmm. in a way to where you at least understand it or respect right. it, you know? So, and I'm and I'm just asking, right? Because I agree. Like, like my like my wife, we had to have a black OBGYN, OBG, you know, the motherfuckers that to pick take the babies out. Mm-hmm. Yeah, like they had to be black and a woman, right? <laughs> For several reasons, <laughs> you know. But so I get it, Adrian. Yeah, now, sorry, Alex. I just because his shit, he's not blurry. We can hear him okay. So I just want to give him a chance. Now. Before he dropped yeah, off. I, I switched to the laptop, man. I switched Thank to the laptop. God, man. <laughs> <My bad. laughs> but nah, I think I think having somebody who looks like you, it's important for I don't think it changes the effectiveness of the therapist, right? Mm-hmm. And I'm a therapist and I have a therapist, but it's just more about the patient or your client. They feel more um comfortable because the way we are, the way we are trained, we're neutral regardless mm-hmm. so sometimes um having somebody having a therapist who can relate to you sometimes that could be a bad thing too right because then they can mm-hmm. start pushing putting their own like personal views on the situation or mm-hmm. how they view it and then they can be triggered and so now both of y'all you know messed up so I, right. I wouldn't necessarily rule it out just because um they look different sometimes that may be a positive meaning that they're literally going to just sit there <laughs> focus with you on your thoughts because when you go to therapy i always describe it like okay like you're the master of you're the expert on your own life you're driving the car i'm just in the passenger seat with you we're going to explore the different things that you've been through we're going to come up with different goals then i'm going to help you get to where you want to get to by maybe challenging some of those negative thoughts some of those negative patterns um as well as just giving you different tools whether you're struggling with anxiety you know depression and using different things like that so i don't really need to look like you or understand what you are going through in order to help you reach a goal so i think it goes both ways but like me personally my therapist is a black woman um and that's just what i prefer but it's a lot of other therapists, you know, that I work with that don't look nothing like me. It's majority white women, but they know what they are talking about. Mm-hmm. So that's mm-hmm. that's my thoughts. But I do think everybody should go to therapy because um, like it's just mental. So even if it's just for a checkup, you go to get a yearly checkup for your physical health. You know, you should go for a yearly checkup for your mental health. You don't got to go every every week. Um, and it can be something based upon you know, what it is that you're going through. I know I put off going to therapy for a while because I felt like I'm already a therapist. You're not going to be able to tell me nothing. I don't know anyway. So it won't be, you know, helpful. But she um, she got me right. She she definitely checked me. So never mind. I'll save my next thing for my final thought. <laughs> All right, look, <laughs> we, up ag- we up against it. Um, this conversation must continue. Um, yes. We'll phrase the question in a different way. To conjure up some different thoughts and aspects, having a therapist and the people that went to school and actually done it on a panel makes a huge difference. Um, but I think it's important for us to all to have some type of understanding so we can have the conversation, you know, and have discourse if necessary. So, you know, I don't really mess with Jerry Springer, but I do like one of his constructs. Final thought. There's nothing wrong. Uh, with a prenup, get it if you need to. And we all have mental health. Make sure you protect it. Make sure you take care of it. Indeed. All right. Final thought. Find a therapist you can trust. Nice. Um, black women, we don't have to be strong all the time. Being weak is actually a strength. Use it. Uh, final thought. Um, I think that there's nothing wrong with checking in with your spouse. Um, you should have check-in points regardless of if there is an expiration date or not. Um, and you should never enter a marriage if you're not looking for the betterment of your spouse, regardless of however that situation ends up. Um, and then also mental health. I think that you should always check in with someone. Um, if it's If you can't afford it, um, you know, speak to somebody about whatever you're going through and uh, make sure that you voice whatever your concerns are. 
Do your best to gain knowledge and understanding of yourself and your situation, your surroundings, and how to improve that by any means. Um, when you are looking for a therapist, typically you'll get a consultation. That's when you grill the therapist, ask them whatever questions you want to ask, training, all of those different things, because it's a service that you are paying for. So even if you don't find the right fit, make sure you just shop around until you do. But everybody should get therapy. Now, Adrian, question. Did you say ask or ask? <laughs> I said ask. Oh. I said ask. You say either one. <laughs> We know that X is a black scent. Listen, I (laughs) I I think that marriage is forever, with the exception of adultery. Mm -hmm. Um, and I think that we do need need to take care of ourselves. I still think there is value to being tough. I think that is how we got this far. But it's important to explore what tough also looks like and when it's necessary and when you may you need somebody where you can feel comforted enough to let down your guard and to be vulnerable. Um, easier said than done for black men, but with the right people, we can we can do it and we'll get there. So like, share, subscribe, tell a friend to tell a friend. And we out.